Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Questions You Never Thought to Ask, the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast. This is going to be episode 16 uh, with a very interesting character um, all the way from England, Darren Clarkson King. I'm really fired up on this one. I think it was a really good episode. I hope you're going to enjoy it um, as much as I enjoyed making it. Uh, if you like this podcast and you want to help uh, support it, I would really love if you could help me out. Um, I've got like a crowdfunding type page on uh, patreon.com. That's patreon.com slash Seth Ashworth. Uh, and you can chip in a couple of bucks uh, every month and get out of it whenever you want. You'll also get a early access to these new podcast episodes as they come up. So if you're fired up, you can listen, uh, yeah, you can listen there. So yeah, if you uh, want to check it out, sweet. If not, sweet. Enjoy this podcast and I will see you next time. Peace. Okay, welcome back to Questions You Never Thought to Ask, the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast. This week, I'm joined by one of the UK's uh, veteran whitewater explorers, Darren Clarkson King, aka Daz. Uh, Daz, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, Seth. How are you, man? I'm great, mate. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, no a lot of people probably listening to this uh, podcast don't know who you are, Daz. I would say you're like one of those like under the radar slayers who's been out and at it for a really long time, and you've done a lot of the like big hard um, check marks that a lot of other whitewater kayakers strive for. Um, you've done first ascents. You've paddled a lot in like, Nepal and Asia. You've done Stikine and, and kind of the Out West um, Triple Crown. Uh, can you introduce yourself to everyone who doesn't know who you are in like, just give us a two minute rundown. Who is Daz Clarkson? Uh, yeah, Daz Clarkson King. Daz Clarkson, Clarkson King. King. Sorry. Daz Clarkson King, mate. He doesn't apologize for being a Yorkshireman. So if I've got anyone listening that's not British, you might find my English really hard, but we'll have to just cope with that because I'm a Yorkshireman and I'm proud. Uh, I live in Wales when I'm in Britain, but I spend nine months a year in the Himalayas. Uh, like you just said, I've paddled North American Triple Crown, uh, which is obviously Alsek, Stikine, Sisitna. Uh, I've paddled extensively in the Himalayas, uh, solo kayaks from Everest, which is the Aaron and the Dud Cozy. But I've also done all the rivers and Everest. That also includes the Rongbuk Chu, uh, the Braldon in Pakistan, that's off K2, Ishkaman, which in Pakistan, which splits the Hindu Kush and Karakorums. Uh, multiple solo laps on the Zarap Chu in Ladakh, uh, and then did a speed descent on the Zarap Chu Zanskar Indus with George Junger a couple of years back, and the 240-kilometre trip we did in 20 hours, 50 minutes non-stop, which is pretty cool. Uh, High-water monsoon laps in Nepal, first descents in Nepal, Pakistan, Tibet, Bhutan, India, oh, that's pretty quick, isn't it? That's about all I can say, really. Uh, yeah, a couple I mean, of guidebooks. I think for, for, for people who don't know who you are, that definitely is a pretty good flavour about um, what you're all about and what you've been uh, doing in your whitewater life. Uh, and the thing you left out there, which I think is also important, is that you run a company that does um, uh, outdoor adventure tourism in, in Asia. Um, you do, like, kayaking trips and stuff, right? Yeah, we do. Uh, we have a company called Pure Land Expeditions. We do kayaking trips, everything from kayak schools right through to expeditions. We also do rafting trips, uh, SUP trips, uh, vintage Royal Enfield motorcycle rides across the highest navigable road in the world in the Himalayas, uh, paragliding, trekking, mountain biking, that sort of stuff. Great. So let's get right into it then. In in your like uh, a lot of your achievements list that you kind of stated there, um, some of your biggest achievements um, are some of your solo endeavors um, around the rivers of of Everest. Um, a rough a rough outline, like you said, you paddled like all the rivers that flow off of Everest and and K two. Yeah. Um, so let's let's talk a, a bit. You did a solo paddle of the dude and the Aaron. Um, alone, unsupported, nobody had done it before. Uh, what made you want to get into that and how much soloing had you done before you went on that trip? Right, uh, let me try and answer that sort of as quickly, not as quickly, but as sort of painlessly as I can, I guess. Why did I do it? The simple answer to it is jet lag. I'd just come back from working in Nepal, uh, back to Britain, and I was on social media and there's a clothing company called Berghaus, Give them a little shout out. Uh, and they had a competition to submit expedition proposals and they would fund it. They would give a thousand pound and a thousand pound worth of gear. So in a jet lag state, I 
filled a form in saying I wanted to solo the Rivers of Everest. A few years previously, I'd done the Dud Cozy and the Aaron with t- as part of teams, uh, and I figured it was probably pretty cool to solo. So the expedition proposal was to fly into Lukla and then walk up to Everest Base Camp uh, or as far as I could get and then paddle down the Dud, uh, which joins the Sun Cozy, then paddle down the Sun Cozy until it joins the Arun. Uh, the Arun joins just near Chatra. And then it's when I first did the Arun, it was a six-day walk into the putting of the Arun. So I set off on this journey. Uh, I got just below Namchi Bazaar, which is where I'd originally put in the dud. Uh, it was part of a team years before. And paddled down uh, the top section, made the portage. Uh, I know the, some of that portage is now being paddled uh, by Ben Stokesbury and Surgeon Tamang. And then put, put in below the portage and paddled out to the Sun Cozy. When I got to the Aaron, there's now a jeep road that goes up the side. So a six-day walk became a day bus ride and a day's jeep ride to the putting. And the six-day paddle out in the gorge became two and a half days because when I'm by myself, I get up early and I paddle till late. And that was as sort of quick and as painless as I could make it. Now, I learned a lot about soloing then, but I had soloed quite a lot before. I'd, back in 2000, I'd done a river in Nepal called the Buddha Ganga. I don't expect people to have heard of it, but I solo first descended that river, which was like a really small tributary of the Seti Canali, which is in, in itself is a tributary of the Canali. Uh, I've yeah, done quite a lot of soloing before then. Um, I was listening to a, a talk you gave about um, about that that solo trip, um, and you said you were like fully alone, like but you didn't have like a sat phone or any means of communication, like a spot or an in reach. Um, why would you put yourself in a position like that? Or is that true? Yeah. And why, why I, did you I, put yourself in a position of like so? So what no I did, huh? you know, So what what I did on that trip, I wanted to be as self sufficient as possible. You know, I wanted to be as close to being at one with the river as I could. So I carried all my own gear uh, from day one. I didn't do a food resupply from day one, uh, which was quite intense. Uh, I, you know, didn't take as much food as perhaps I should have done. But like I said, I wanted to be truly alone. I did have a spot on me, but I never pressed it. I didn't want to waymark any of it. I didn't speak to my wife or any of my friends or any of my contacts to say where I was uh, at all until I got to the end, at which point I did phone up my wife. So I did have communication, but I didn't want to use it. It was right in the back of a dry bag in the back of the boat. So it's a little bit untrue that I didn't have a spot, but I didn't waymark it on the way down or any of that stuff uh, because I did want to be alone and isolated. And um, paddling solo, it's like you said you've done a little bit before. Uh, what, what would you say to people? Like, do you think it's something everyone should do? Like, should everyone try and solo once in their life? Like, is it unadvisable? What, what's, what's your right. choose? This is a hot, hot button issue, I think, in kayaking. And a lot of think... people seem to see it really black and white and they fall like hard on one side or hard on the other. And there's not that many people who are in the grey middle and, and their opinions on it. So what's your, uh, where do right. you sit? So we can argue long and hard about this. Now, I really enjoy a solo. Uh, I enjoy a solo that's at my paddling ability or, le- or like easier water than I normally paddle with peers. Now, I think you've got to be super careful when you do choose to solo that you don't overstretch your personal ability. Uh, because you have got nobody there. Now, a friend of mine once said that if you're paddling a pair, like a lot of paddlers paddle in partnership, what you're really doing is soloing, but with somebody else to look after as well. So you're not just, you know, you're soloing and watching somebody else. Uh, as a, somebody who guides, and I, you know, we, I, as a guide in remote areas, I actually find guiding more stressful than soloing because I'm not only thinking on the river about my sp- uh, mental state and my paddle ability on a river when I'm guiding, but also all the clients I've got, you know, in a deep gorge or whatever. So I do find soloing to be l- less stressful uh, than running uh, commercial trips in that situation. Uh, it's not necessarily as stressful, it's not as easy as paddling with a group of peers that I've paddled with for years, uh, where you know your mates have got your back. But having said that, uh, I do tend to make more mistakes when I peer paddle than when I paddle solo. Should everyone do it? 
uh, I think that's a personal call. I'm not going to shout it out and say, you know, people need to solo this or people shouldn't solo that. Uh, I think it is a personal choice. I also think it's a personal choice if people choose to run rapids quickly uh, or if they choose to run it slowly. Uh, scouting, I think, is, while it's always advisable to scout blind drops, I think people have to got to be responsible for their actions if they don't scout drops, uh, even if it's rivers they've run a thousand times. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's pretty interesting, some really interesting points you brought up there, um, especially about pat- how paddling with one other person is kind of like soloing and like and looking up to someone else. I hadn't ever really hadn't ever really considered it like from that from that point of view. It's uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean that, that was somebody uh, a friend of mine, a guy called Dan Yates, uh, said that to somebody when they got on the stakine. He saw two two guys getting on the stakine, and he was like, "Yeah, you, you guys are like soloing the stakine, but watching out for your mates as well," uh, which obviously does add, add another dimension. Yeah, it's you an know, interesting. I'd like never, never ever considered it like that. But it, like when you, when you like phrase it like that, it's pretty. I, I don't know. I, I find most people would probably agree it's pretty accurate. Like when you're a, a two, you've got, you know, you're looking after yourself plus one, and the other person's looking after them plus you. But, yeah. You know, there's just one of you. So. How yeah, much, I mean, I, how much can you really do as as one other person? Exactly. I mean, I do. I do find that when I'm. When I'm paddling by myself, I do have to rein myself in a lot. Uh, you know, like I'm really when I wait, when I paddle by myself on long multi days, I get up at first light or sometimes before first light, and I'm on the water like super quick, and I paddle until it's nearly dark, and I have to sort of draw myself back sometimes because if you're with peers, you'd get off the water pretty early, I guess, in the afternoon, maybe cook some good food and have you know have a chat around the fire and stuff. But when you're by yourself, I don't do that. And uh, I have to remind myself that it's not a race. You know, I have to just sit back sometimes. Uh, yeah. And I guess that's that, that's one of the big dynamic differences I find is that the river time itself is not massively different. I, you know, especially if I'm if I'm soloing a river, I've done a lot. Uh, I tend to still make the same edges that I would if I was spotting a friend coming through, and I make the same lines. It's almost like there's a ghost paddler behind me that I'm waiting to come through. Uh, I find myself doing that a lot, but you know, it's not necessarily always the case. But it's the night times when you're alone in a deep gorge or alone on a river somewhere, and you're cooking your meal, and you've got no one to talk to about the day. They're the times that it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I can see that. I am. Um, I haven't done very much soloing at all, and mostly just to do like solo freestyle stuff. But not uh, the idea of being like alone for days at a time. I don't know if it's. I don't know if I have. It has the same appeal to me as it evidently does to you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite hard. Eh? I mean, I, you know, 21 days, the, the, the Everest trip was about 21 days, and that was 21 days of isolation, which people, you can go a little bit crazy, eh? But, you know, I mean, not my, my normal day run when I live in India, my sort of day run, my local run is the Zarap Zanskar, uh, which, you know, should take around six, seven days, I guess 240k, 220k, depending where you put on. But I tend to be able to run that through in about three days if I'm by myself uh, because I know, you know, I know where I'm camping and the food I'm taking and stuff, but it is different, completely different, you know, running in those situations to running a play boat in run or like a local hall that you're going to play on or that sort of stuff. Yeah, for sure. I, um, yeah, a lot of interesting things to think about with uh, what you said there, Ollie, giving me some, give me some food, for, food for thought for the uh, yeah, indeed, future. Sir. You've yeah. um you you paddled a lot in Nepal and, and Asia and like a lot of first descents. Um and you you're you're pretty well explored over there. Um and I think a lot of paddlers from Europe, uh, especially from England, tend to like migrate like that way in terms of paddling trips. But if you live in like Canada or North America here, generally people are, are like more inclined to go to South America. Um yeah, for sure. generally flights are a bit cheaper, it's geographically uh, a lot mm-hmm. closer. What would be your like elevator pitch to get those people to start checking out like nepal or india or one of those other spots that you spend a lot of time yeah i mean for a lot of people i mean i've, I've not been to pakistan since after, just after 9 11 during just after 7 7 uh but pakistan is an amazing country it was super friendly then i know it's super friendly now uh it's an amazing culture in pakistan the water's brilliant you don't have to paddle super hard you can paddle 
you're like class three, class four, if that's what you want to paddle. It's just amazing. Now, I spend most of my year now in India, uh, up in Kashmir, uh, general Kashmir, up in Ladakh. And we have like the birth of the Indus. While well, the Indus comes out of Tibet and then it hits into general Kashmir. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. Uh, like I say, amazing Buddhist culture. There's enough rivers there for a really superb multi-day class three, class four. There is quite a bit of class five as well to do. And there's still rivers that need to be explored over there. Uh, if you know if you've got a good crew uh, and you're happy to sort logistics out on the ground, there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be done. Uh, well, we have got a guidebook out there that myself and saying Chotak wrote. There's a lot of rivers omitted because it's just not being able for us to get in there. Uh, you are going to be expected to put horses onto mules or porters to walk into this stuff. Uh, and that's why I really like Northern India, South India, down Malabar. Malabar's got to be one of my favourite competitions, festivals in the world. Uh, it's a big money competition down in Malabar. Uh, quite a lot of big name paddlers go down there. Rain, you know, rain dependent monsoon, short runs, but super amazing. You know, people down there, like the local paddlers down there, are really super keen. I like that. But now Nepal, Nepal's had kayakers in there for best part of 30, 40 years. So there's a really good infrastructure for kayakers in Nepal. There's logistics are super easy, whether you're on a commercial trip or you're doing it yourself. You don't have to fly a boat into Nepal. You just fly to Kathmandu. You can hire modern boats. I mean, our company, you know, we have OGs, Spades, Letmans. I know that other companies have, you know, similar class of boats, Zens and stuff like that. So you are going to be hiring a boat that is similar to the boat you paddle back home. Really good logistics. The guidebooks, obviously, guidebooks do change. There's more roads in there now, so to get in and out of rivers uh, is getting easier. There are some hydro projects in Nepal, and rivers. we are losing rivers in Nepal pretty quick, so you need to be getting into Nepal and getting those done if you want it. And believe it or not, even after 40 years of exploration, Nepal still has first descents left for people that are committed to going to these rivers. And I'm not saying these rivers are hard. I'm just saying they need commitment to get in. And I think that's a good draw for people. So in all the countries I'm talking about, you know, there's still a good adventure out there. There's some really good recreational kayaking as well. And I, I phrase it as recreation for those that really enjoy class two, class three, maybe SUP and ducky trips. There's some great rivers there. And uh, for the last few years, I've been spending time in Bhutan and Bhutan just blows me away every time for obvious reasons. Uh, the fact that I can get into Bhutan relatively easy. Uh, even though there's a, a quite an expensive visa situation, and the rivers are you know amazingly clean. The river that runs through the capital city, the Timpu Chu. I don't know any other river in the world where the river that flows through the capital city you can drink without using a filter bottle. Wow! And uh, you know, it's just amazing. I, I love Bhutan. You know, I, I, lo I love the the quality of river, the quality of service you'll get from the local Bhutanese as well. It's just it's amazing, and that's got rivers. Uh, from fl family float trips right through to some really hard, deep gorges that are so deep that people can't hear you scream. Wow. You know, yeah. Well, if that's not a compelling elevator pitch for like your next paddling trip to be in Asia, I don't know. I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's yeah. move it along a little bit. Um, in a lot of interviews, you have talked about like the food you eat um, when you're on trips and stuff. Uh, ben Stukesbury and Rush Sturgis, like big name paddlers who are like heavy proponents of the vegan diet. What's your what's your take on all that? Like, what's your what's your eating regime? What's your so two cents on on what to eat and healthy eating with Daz Clarkson King? Yeah, so healthy. And I've been a, a vegetarian for the best part of thirty years. Now I'm one of those vegetarians that's not well. As I get older, I get more healthy. But I was a vegetarian that wasn't super healthy. You know, I'd always go for the vegetarian sweets or the cake or stuff like that. And uh, before I knew much about diet and nutrition, my idea of bulking up for an expedition was to have donuts for breakfast every day and flapjack at lunchtime. And for those that don't know what flapjack is, it's just really nice. And then have some more dessert for lunch. But as I've got older and I've got a little bit more sane, when I do uh, my solo trips, I tend to take, just take rice, dal and vegetables to cook. Although I did a trip last year where I took vegan pizza because I was only out for three days. I took pizza from the local pizza restaurant uh, in Leigh. Uh, 
but you know, if we are on commercial trips when we run our pure land trips, we have a really mixed diet with fresh fruits, veggies, fresh meats, and fish, uh, like you'd expect. But I think you've got to look after your health. I've just paddled a lot with Pringle, James Bebbington. Yep. And, uh, he's, For people he's who into- don't know who that is, he's like a British freestyle kayaker who's like uh, was a world champion in 2011, and then is like a really strong advocate for raw, raw vegan diet, which is like we don't cook any food. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, like I said, I paddled in Bhutan with Pringle, and he was he was into he was doing his raw food thing, and I was amazed how many calories he was getting down his neck in a day. Uh, he was eating a lot of raw food. I mean, he had bags of it, bags and bags, which I don't think is super practical for a multi day if you're in the back of your boat. But it works really well for James, you know, for Pringle, it worked really well. And he, he looks, you know, he's healthy on it and he's, he's bulked up really well. But for myself, I'm a vegetarian, I've been for a long time. I try and cut out cheese and dairy and to, to go vegan, but I just love cheese too much. Uh, but when, I, when I'm in Asia, I do, I do cut cheese out completely. Right on, right on, right on. Yeah, it's interesting to see all the kind of, I guess like nutrition science is getting more readily available to people now. So there's more. Yeah, for sure. I'm like, I'm for sure more interested in it than I was like five years ago. And I think it's a lot more like in the public eye. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. It's interesting just to speak to, you know, like top paddlers and see uh, what they're all eating. I thought I had read somewhere, but then I couldn't find reference to it again. Um, Maybe I dreamt about it, but I thought you'd been kidnapped on one of your Asia trips. (laughs) Uh, Not quite kidnapped. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> so back in let me get the date so about 2002 uh, yeah 2002 myself uh, Craig and Robin we were doing the Aaron Gorges for the first time now people have to understand that this was in Nepal at the sort of height of the Maoist revolution uh, the civil war that was taking place after uh, sort of started around 98 uh, and then reached its peak uh, into 2000 when the the crown prince shot up all his family, murdered all his family. And then as it sort of went through 2000, I'm sure it was 2000, uh, it sort of the Maoist revolution sort of took hold, the civil war took hold. So we were walking into the Aaron, a six day walk in, and we walked into what can only be described as Maoist heartland. Now I have to emphasize that this was back in 2002. It's not like that now. Uh, And we walked into a village that had probably a couple of hundred Maoist terrorists in there with big knives and guns and stuff like that. And we were put under house arrest in the village uh, and were sort of asked to donate to the cause of Maoism. Uh, if we were British, we had to pay X amount of dollars. And if we were American, they wanted us to chip a lot more, which is really good that we were all Brits. Now, Craig is like Scottish by choice. And he was explaining that he was not English, he was Scottish, at which point one of the Maoists just shouted the famous line from the Mel Gibson movie, freedom! <laughs> at, which, at, which point, at which point the tension sort of died a little. Now, we had a translator on that. Uh, we didn't have a translator. They had a translator who was the head teacher from the local village school in Num. Uh, and while we were sat chatting, he was asking us what we did for livings. And this is before I was guiding full time. And, Craig explained that his job, he worked in a bank, he worked for the Bank of Scotland, and the teacher who was acting as translator said, oh, thank you so much. Can you do algebra? Because I have to teach algebra to the school children, and I, <laughs> I don't understand it. So we're in a tea house surrounded by Maoist rebels doing algebra on the table. Uh, now, that worked really well, and in the morning, we woke up super early and ran down to the river and got on and got on to what was at the time the hardest river I've ever paddled. For those that don't know, the Aaron Gorges is like I say, six days of class five, five plus. Uh, there's quite a few crooks moves in there. Now on, I think it was day two, could be possibly day three. My memory's a little bit hazy on it. We heard gunshots uh, from above the gorge, at which point we were a bit panicked as you would expect. I said, Craig, you know, Craig, what do we do? And Craig was like, well, I think it's lunchtime, isn't it? And we had lunch, sort of, we listened to where the guns were firing and we had lunch on that side of the gorge so nobody could see us. Uh, We finished the river, we paddled out and uh, it transpired that the Maoists that we met and had run down to the river from in the morning 
uh, a day after seeing us, they'd blown up a hydro station, they'd blown up a police station, and they'd robbed an Italian Spanish climbing party. Uh, oh, wow. And when I and the, and, but they'd robbed them naked, not just robbed them, they'd robbed them naked. Wow. So, uh, and uh, we we actually met the, the climbing party uh, on the trail. We were walking in, and they were walking in. So I'm lucky that they didn't do that to us. Would you but, say yeah. that was your like riskiest story, like uh, your like run-ins with the run-ins with um, the terrorist guys? Yeah. I mean, it's it's funny because you know I look back now and you know Nepal's like a second home to me, and even having incidents like that still never uh, affected me and wanted me not to go to Nepal. And I have to emphasize, Nepal's not like that now. You know, it's, it was a time of political turmoil for Nepal, and Nepal's a lot more settled now. Was that the risky time? No, nah, not super risky. I mean, in Pakistan, we were driving quite often. We we were looking for first descents and stuff like that, and we, we drove a lot through warlord territory with guys with AK-47s and shoulder-mounted rocket launchers and stuff. So that, that was a little bit daunting. But when you're young and stupid, you sort of do that sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean... I've never felt threatened. I mean, even up in, you know, in that situation, it was. I never thought my life was at threat. Maybe my uh, bank account was at threat, but my life never felt to be at threat. All right, that's uh, well, that's pretty good. Let's um, <laughs> let's let's cycle back to something you were talking about um, earlier in your explanation. You were saying about doing the Sarap Chu with a uh, fellow British kayaker, George Younger, in yeah, yeah. Twenty, 20 hours and fifty minutes for a yeah, yeah. a river, which is. In, from what I can understand about it, 240 kilometers, like pretty much all moving white water. Like, right, what was yeah. the, how, how did that come about? Like, what motivated that? Could you have done right. it quicker? <laughs> what did you have to eat to make yourself go that fast? Okay, like, so, why has no one anyone done that before? Right, so I've run the river a lot. Like, the Zarp Chu is my, in North, when I'm in North India, it's my go to trip that we sell as Pure Land. It's also my go to river that I go and have social time on. I've probably soloed it more than anyone. I've definitely uh, paddled it more than anybody did last season. Uh, but, you know, I know the river really, really well. But when I, I ran it a week before, uh, myself, George Younger, and a, a paddler called Natty Corden, and we ran it, and every night I was writing down in my diary how many hours on the water for the six-day descent. So I'd write down in my diary. And then it got to, Natty went home. She was on a trip. Natty, Natty went home. And me and George sat down and I was like, George, this is like 24 hours, 24 and a half hours. We've paddled in total on the whole trip. Do you think we could do it in a day? And George was like, well, that's a, that's a day, isn't it? 24 hours, 24 and a half hours is just over a day. We can shave a half hour off. I'm sure we can do it in a day. So we waited for a full moon and drove up to the putting, which takes about 13 hours. So we drove to the putting, uh, and set off like we set off at six in, six in the morning and we paddled for 20 hours and 50 minutes and that includes the whole of the Zarap and the whole of the Zanskar. Now, in the middle of the Zarap, there's a, uh, there was a landslide in the Zarap a few years ago and there's a big lake in there now. So it's dead flat in the middle before, the, before it bursts through the back of the landslide. So you, we had to nail through that uh, the flat section quite early on in, in the trip, really. Uh, the sun wasn't fully up. And then we just we didn't get out of his boats at all. We didn't make any eddies. We didn't speak to each other. And we paddled all the way through. And when we got to the Zanskar, we wanted to be hitting the first rapid of the Zanskar in daylight, even though it's a full moon, uh, because the first rapid in the Zanskar is quite hard. Sadly, we got to it at 9 o'clock at night, and it was pitch black, and the moon wasn't up. So we ran a rapid that I think is a good class 4 uh, in the pitch black. Um, can you can you paint can you paint a little bit of a picture of like the characteristic and style of the river? People yeah, who haven't been there yeah, before sorry. have no so, idea. Yeah, yeah, sorry guys. So the, yeah, the, the, the Zarap is high in the Himalayas. It's over four thousand meters at the putting. It's tight, tight box canyon uh, walls. Most of which, well, all of which, you don't want to be scouting because the you've got to climb out of a box to scout. So you've got to run it on site. A lot of them are class three, three plus. There's some definite fours in there. There's a rapid called Riru. There's one portage that is, I would suggest, is a mandatory portage. Uh, for those that have seen Noria's video, Noria uh, swims through that portage. Uh, but that is, I would say, is a mandatory portage. 
and then you've got to the halfway, well not halfway, a bit further down, you've got a rapid called Riru Falls, which I would position at a class five at certain water levels. And it's you've, if, if you part, you can portage the top of it, but you have to run the bottom of it. There's no portage on the bottom now. There used to be years ago. And then you've got big water, class three, four, uh, all the way down to you join the Zanskar. The Zanskar then goes flat, amazingly scenic, but goes flat and is moving until you get into the gorge there, the canyon, which is often called the Grand Canyon of Asia. It's a beautiful, beautiful canyon. Uh, copper... Uh, in the rock, Zanskar means land of copper, so it's got copper in the rock, like purples and aquamarines and turquoises and blues, uh, beautiful. But you've got a big rapid pretty much as soon as you hit the gorge, big class four at certain water levels, and then it stays at like a class four for the rest of that journey for like, like 100k until it hits the Indus and then it goes flat. Big volume, super good fun, uh, except when you've been paddling for you know, nigh on 20 hours, in which case you get really tired, you know. And uh, if you're running it by moonlight, the hardest thing about running by moonlight is that you get weird shadows. Now, you know, on a river that I know super well, I was expecting to see a hole because the moonlight was bouncing off the water and it looked like there was a hole forming, when really it was nothing, it was just flat. See, mine was playing tricks as well. Uh, like I say, amazingly beautiful place. Quite a lot of volume, I can't remember, you know, it's a lot of volume, uh, but tight technical gorge at the top, and then it opens out a little bit and then becomes a really nice sort of canyon when you hit the Zanskar. And what, what did you guys like? What was your eating plan for that? You didn't stop for 20 hours, you just like no, smashed a big stop. meal before you start? And no, we, we sort of, we, uh, we, we, we smashed a big meal before we left on the Jeep ride to the pudding, and then we decided that we'd take protein bars, you know, like uh, energy bar type things, yep. and, we'd take, and we'd take 24 energy bars, which is a bar an hour, which we, yeah. which we thought, we, which is a lot of protein bars. Yeah. You know, that, that's like a lot of protein bars. Now, I mean, we, a, a bar an hour, that's like enough, car, you know, enough calories in our bodies. We can drink water out of the river as we go. It's all good. We'll just keep going and keep going and keep going. Now, we didn't realise how much whey and dairy products are in these protein bars that we bought in India. And George is lactose intolerant. So after oh about eight hours, yeah. So after about eight hours, George was looking to get out of his dry suit. <laughs> cool. But uh, I think when we got back to the beach, like super early in the morning, my wife was in the tent at the takeout. We used to live at the takeout. And my wife was there, and she didn't expect us till like early in the morning. And she had a big flask of tea and samosas and stuff. So that was pretty nice. Nice. That's yeah, pretty like, sweet. It sounds like an exciting, exciting mission, and the um, with a, a colorful, colorful uh, program. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an amazing one. I mean, we, we, you know, the Zanskar trip in itself is a, a world class trip. It's a world class rafting trip, world class kayaking trip. The Zarap, as an addition to that. Is just an amazingly wild, beautiful, isolated gorge. You know, obviously taking your time into it, going in there uh, is really special. We just wanted to smash it out, as, see if it was possible to do it in under a day, which obviously you know we we did. It, it goes, yeah, for sure. It goes. Now a week a week earlier, uh, a friend of mine called uh, Horst Hattinger. He did the same trip. Now, you know, st standardly you'll do it in six, seven days if you paddle it. But Horst took 14 days over it wow. because, he'd pad because he'd paddle for an hour and then he'd walk up into the, he said, quite isolated guards. There's not many uh, habitants that live in there, not many villages. But he'd walk in when he saw a settlement, he'd walk in and help them farm. I would hang out at the monastery that's in uh, Puktal. And so he just spent a lot of time. He did it. It took about 14 days, I think to do it cool. and it just and it, it, I mean, it proves that this is such a special place that you can spend that much time in there yeah it's, it's the, the option the range of options you have from a 20 hour day to a 14 day trip and yeah. the, same, the same it's just yeah that's yeah, it's, nuts. Just, it's, it's amazing eh? so let's change gears again uh, okay. right now you're living the dream you're, you're running your own um, expeditions company um, but before before you were before you were making like, kayaking a job, what was the uh -huh. strangest thing you had to do to live the dream? <laughs> I once counted jigsaw pieces. What? Yeah, yeah. I, I used to, there's a, a British, I don't even know if it still exists, a British games company called Waddington's. I don't know, they made Monopoly and Sabutio. 
Okay. Uh, I'm sure Waddington. I don't know if Parker bought them out or Mattel. But anyway, Waddington's, it's, you know, they had Monopoly and Cluedo, I think, was one of theirs. But I had a summer job uh, when I was only a kid. I think I was about 16. And uh, they, were, they made jigsaws, but the machine didn't punch the jigsaws properly. So you had to count the pieces as they came out to make, <laughs> before you put them in a box. So I've, I counted jigsaw pieces for a long time for a job once. That was interesting. Uh, like I say, I think I bought my first topper with the money. I for those that don't know, topper was probably the best kayak ever made. But uh, <laughs> I bought, I, I bought, I, I bought. A to I think I bought a topper with that money. Now, All right. Other... Well, that is, yeah. I, that was a, a whole tangent I wasn't expecting. There. It's, uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. How, I, I. Okay. Well, let's move. Let's move on again. That's that's a good answer. I don't have anything else to follow up on that. Um, uh, you, you've been paddling for a long time. You've been doing like expeditions of first ascents and stuff for a long time. And you started in a time like kind of before Instagram, before Facebook, before YouTube, before Twitter, before podcasts, before like a lot of the, the social media platforms existed. And a lot of the trips you've done with like very few pictures or very few videos and just like, you know, lots of words and your, your thoughts and you've written a book and stuff. Um, what do you think would be different if the paddling world and all the media it had now when you started kayaking? Oh, it's funny because, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you'd, you'd like meet on a river, you'd meet your friends or you'd go to a, a paddling festival or whatever, but you'd hear stories in pubs or behind, around campfires about a paddler that had done this river or a paddler that had been to this country. And there was always this big myth around it. And as, as you know, when you told a story, the images you, you get in your in your own mind's eye may be completely different to what actually happened. And now I think with the with the advent of social media, people can actually see what uh, what what the paddlers experiencing, you know, almost in real time. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of people can actually do it in real time as well, but. Uh, you know, you can see, if you're not hearing a story that's three months old, you're actually reacting to a story that's instant. And I think that's brilliant. But I, on the flip side, I don't quite like it. I always liked the mystery of it. You know, I liked hearing these stories about the strange paddler that had been to the Pakistan in the 80s, and I liked those stories. You know, there was always that little bit of myth and legend around it. But I think Instagram's really good for the profile of the sport and profile of certain athletes. I mean, for for one, paddlers are now called athletes, whereas when I was in my twenties, we were just called people that bummed around in boats. You know, <laughs> but you know, I, 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 I do think you know social media is really good. It's good for the sport. Definitely, it raises awareness for the sport. It raises awareness for brands that within the sport. It's a really good advertising platform for brands. Is a good is a good platform for people to show what they're doing. It's also really good if you're a kayaker and canoeist or SUP or whatever it may be, and you want to gauge your own ability, not just against your peers, but against other you know other people that are, that are posting. You know what I don't like about it, and uh, I think this is a big drawback is people see a, a GoPro video clip, for example and the comfy on their sofa or sat in a bar somewhere watching it on the phone or whatever. And they think oh, I can go and do that because I can paddle class four and that, that's a class four clip with, but what they don't have is all the external stuff, you know, like especially if it's Himalayan or maybe California where you've got the long walking. So you're tired at the putting, you've got a boat that weighs X amount of kilos because you've got your food in it. You're not, you know, your boat's not performing super well. And I think people do get themselves into a bit of mischief by putting on rivers that perhaps technically they can do because of, but they've seen a video of it. Oh, I can do that. I can do that. But then the other stuff's not accounted for necessarily in that video. And I'm, yeah, thinking, of, you know, I'm thinking of the short little clips that you get, you know, like the 30 second clips uh, that people post. And I think that distracts a lot for me. That takes away a lot of the adventure of paddling. You know, when we didn't have videos on tap to look at, you went into a river and it was always like doing a first descent even if the river had been done a thousand times you know it was always new and i, I do find people scouting less because there's a there's a youtube clip or a gopro clip of that river and I, you know people I, I do know people that have run rivers especially in north wales where i am at the moment that have run rivers on gopro so many times when they get on that river they don't scout 
because wow. the GoPro because the GoPros don't see show people scouting. They just show people that have, that are maybe local on that river doing laps on it, and people think, oh, I can do that, and they get on and they get themselves into a bit of bother. Mm-hmm. Do you think you'd have had the same opportunities in terms of like uh, travel and trips and expeditions uh, that you had if you'd had social media when you started, or do you think you'd had more opportunities or less opportunities? I think there'd be more. I mean. Now, I think with social media, you, with a quick, you know, message on a bot on a forum or in, in a social media post, and you can get information about paddling around the world. You don't. There's not a lot of research required in that way. You know, if if somebody posted on a you know a Facebook group, for example, how do I get a kayak from Delhi to Rishikesh? You're going to get an answer in seconds about how to do that. Whereas, you know, when I was paddling back in Nepal or even in Norway back in 98, we didn't have that. So everything was a little bit more adventurous. It felt that way. Uh, maybe it's just because when you're in your 20s and things seem way more adventurous than when you're in your 40s, you know. But I do think that the social media worlds, well, how would it have affected me? I think I'd have been a lot more of a show-off than I am and I'm still probably quite egocentric, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, I do think, you know, that that's the bad side of it. And there's research, obviously, about people that, you know, affects your ego a lot. And I think that's a battle that everyone at some point has to face. You know, when you're posting content, even talking to you now, you know, there's a certain level of egotism to it. Uh, you know, I think it's just like, it's kind of, for me, it's like, it's just part of, it's part of like everyone's modern day life right now. So it's, you know, you've got to like adapt or adapt or die, in my opinion. Like if you're, if you're not comfortable having a bit of an ego, then you don't have to be on those things. You can just like yeah, exactly. not, not have the benefits of all the information, but also not have all the downsides of like keeping people up to date. Exactly. I mean, it is a, it's a very fine line to walk and I think you've got to keep it in check. Uh, and I think that goes for all paddlers, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, and uh, it's interesting because I saw the, uh, the sponsorship boom in paddling as well, which happened before social media. Yeah, when the, you know when, when when kayakers were getting paid good money and getting nice vehicles and good boats and driving, uh, maybe going on paddling trips. I'm going to you know in the US going to freestyle events or rodeo as it was back then. Or uh, they were getting good funding for trips abroad and the content they were delivering wasn't super high because it was almost like the brands understood it, it that the paddlers were going there to explore and develop their skills as opposed to develop product you know whereas now i think a lot of it is down to product placement and advertising and people do use brand uh, so we're going to get my head around this people do use social media to advertise brands perhaps more than advertising the experience and i don't and what, know, I, you well, know let's talk, let's let's unpack that for a minute because i think that's a pretty interesting point like in in the area i'm based in now in ottawa like there was a time and there's like a bunch of people who live in the town I live in, like Ken Whiting and Tyler Curtis. And, and there was a time when they all had like, you know, they got given a truck and gas money and they got a salary every year. And it was like, you know, your job could be a whitewater kayaker. And it was a long time, like you said, a long time before like the advent of social media and being able to share um, experiences and stuff. How, how do you think, like, where, where did paddling go wrong that it got off of that train of having a lot of money in it? Because to me, it seems like the whitewater world in general would be a lot, a lot better off if there was more money coming into it because it would mean more people were encouraged to get into it, which would kind of, yeah. like, perpetuate the cycle of more people whitewater kayaking, which I think is yeah. ultimately the goal for everyone in mm. the sport. I mean, I don't know if kayaking went off track. I think... That, that terminology is probably not quite right, Seth, but there was a time when there was an explosion uh, of people being paid to paddle. And it was a big explosion. I think it went across the world, not just in North America, but it was much lesser on our little monkey island, you know. And uh, what happened, I think, was the people that funded that, so the, the manufacturers that funded those paddlers, I think they overexpanded. I don't know if this is what happened, but I think they put too much money in and they got too little in return. Whereas I think if they tried now to do the same because of the social media uh, and the fact that people with uh, very limited budgets can make really good movies and they can do lecture tours and people can see movies almost instantaneously on social media, 
people would get a return for that sponsorship. You know, if I get asked a lot by younger paddlers, how do you get sponsored? And one of the simple answers is you've got to prove to who you're approaching to sponsor you that you can give back to them more than they give to you. You know, uh, if you're going to, if you're just looking for a free boat, for example, and say it's about a thousand bucks, which boats are more than that now, but you've got to give more than a thousand bucks back uh, for it to be worth their while uh, in in advertising revenue and that sort of thing. And I think that's what happened, you know, in the heyday of pro paddlers is companies gave a lot of money and their return wasn't massive on that. And I don't know if they saw an increase in sales off it. It'd be really interesting for somebody to do some research in that, and I'd love for somebody to tell me that I'm wrong yeah, on that. Yeah, I would, but... I would love to know the answer too, because kind of the, the way, like nowadays, like especially with how social media is, it's like there's a lot more like trackable metrics. Like, for instance, I can see how many people listen to this podcast, and I can see how many people watch a video on YouTube. Um, and there's a bunch of other like interesting data you can track. But it seems like if there was more, like, you know, there's a, a lot of... Um, older older industry people who are like well you know white water's dying like sales are down blah 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 and mm-hmm. it's like but this that's kind of an, another part of that discussion is that, that like companies are putting less money into like white water marketing budgets yeah. and that like helps to contribute to sales being down and then uh you know it's kind of a, a, a vicious cycle of like less money and less marketing and then like less people yeah, want to sure. play in and, and if there was a little bit of like a flip in in people's like way of thinking and if every single like i'm going to use like air quotes i'm using my hands you can't see them but like if every single like professional kayaker was only interested in engaging people in like the sport of whitewater kayaking and, and like in increasing its profile then more people would be more interested in it and that you know those people would be helped to increase that profile if there was like a little bit more money in this system you know yeah, I, th- I think that's you know that's a very good point. But also the recreation market, and uh, I'm going to look at you know recreation me- uh, in the UK. Sit on tops, you know the, the sit on tops. They need very little marketing behind them. They're really user friendly. Like anybody that can sit down and hold a paddle can use one. They don't need to have special. You don't need have special training to use one, and they're really co- relatively cheap to produce an, an SOT. So. You know, for a company, they've got a good return on that investment of designing that product. Yeah. Uh, there's no, but and I think for the the white water market is really niche. I don't know how you get people from, uh, say, a novice SOT paddler or somebody who maybe goes to scouting or a, a club level paddler that maybe only paddles once a month to get them to be, to use a phrase, addicted to white water to such an extent that. Just losing you a little bit, Daz. hundred on paddle. Uh, sorry, mate. Are you still there? Yeah, I've just lost Hello? you about uh, midway yeah. midway through your 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 piece on people going from sit on tops to white water. Okay, so I'll, I'll recap. Uh, basically, I don't know how, as an industry, we get people from introduction level, so SOT level, in, which I'd say is introduction level to paddle sport, into spending two thousand bucks on a white water kayak. I, I don't know where we can as a as a community put that in place because to be a whitewater kayaker you have to invest a lot of time and a lot of money to get the skills required to even use that product properly whereas and and then you buy the product it's an expensive product you know two thousand bucks for a boat or whatever they are uh and a few hundred bucks for a paddle and helmets and life jackets bond shades and dry suits and it's an expensive Sport. I mean, it's not as expensive as mountain biking, I don't believe, but it's still very expensive when recreation paddlers can buy a sit on top for not a lot of money at all. The equipment they need is very basic, so it's relatively cheap. A company doesn't have to invest a lot in the promotion of that part of the sport, and they get a massive return for it. And yeah, yet, but like, I think, okay, you know, so, so I what I'm I getting at is there's like quite a big disconnect, in my opinion at least, between those people like who buy a sit on top kayak, like they're not engaged in wanting to learn to whitewater kayak. And if like, if they wanted to learn to whitewater kayak, they never would have bought the sit on top in the first place. And that's just because there's not enough marketing dollars in the marketing funnel to get those people engaged in whitewater kayaking. Yeah, no, I I agree with you there, but I mean, it's a engagement in paddle sport. And I think that's a really good thing. Now, 
I don't know how we engage more people in white water. I, I, I've struggled with this for a long time. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the sales in white water boats are higher than when I was first paddling white water. And I'm pretty certain that, you know, the demographic is higher. The, the thing I'm also really certain of, and I'd love somebody to actually back up my, what I believe to be true is that the people that are buying white water boats now, uh, it's not the same people that were buying white water boats, same sector of the community that were buying white water boats back in the 80s or the 70s. I think people that are buying white water boats now are majority upper middle class without getting into a discussion on class and uh, what have you. I think that's where the demographic sits because of the price of the boats and the price of equipment. I think what manufacturers have done it, and I don't think they believe they've done it on purpose, is they've knocked out working class paddlers from buying new product. And I don't believe that was the case 30 years ago. I would mm -hmm. love to be, you know, I don't believe that was the case. Uh, I think 30 years ago, you know, working class paddlers were able to access, you know, boats and stuff like that. Because you could, I mean, back in the 70s, people made their own boats in fiberglass. I mean, I made my, I made a boat at school, you know. So I do think that there's a section of the community that have been denied access to the white water market. Mm, interesting. I think, um, this is like a really interesting topic for me um, because I, I think the future of whitewater kayaking is dependent on there being more whitewater kayakers like across the pyramid, like at the base <laughs> level of like new people coming in and at the top level of like people running the hardest shit and like going on these expeditions and at the biggest yeah. competitions. And I think for the, the pyramid to sit evenly, you need to have people like at all parts of the pyramid. And mm -hmm. but I think it's everyone in the pyramid's responsibility to keep everyone else to keep more people coming in, you know, because people come out all the time. And, like, how we how we help grow our sport is, like, something that, in my opinion, we're all in together. Like, and the, the future of our sport is, like, really dependent, I think, on more and more people being involved or, like, w whatever the happy number to keep uh, everyone kayaking is. Oh, so for I, sure, I think yeah. It's, I think it's everyone's responsibility to be thinking about this, like, ways we can change what we're doing now to engage more people in whitewater kayaking and keep the people who are whitewater kayaking like really fired up on it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I also think that as a community, we have to be more honest with ourselves. Now, I'm speaking in general terms here, you know, so I'm not saying this applies to all kayakers. I'm just being general on this. Now, when a product is released on the market and it's, say the latest race boat you know that latest race boat sells really really well majority of the time you know it's a popular brand and people tend to buy that over the mid-range boat that a whitewater manufacturer would make because everyone assumes that they're a good paddler and therefore they need this you know latest race boat when really they can probably paddle the mid-range boat on most of their stuff and i think if people are more honest with their selves and their own ability, then they can paddle the mid-range boat and leave the top spec boats to the pros. And the the companies can start investing more in marketing to the mid-range paddler uh, and those coming into the sport because it is quite intimidating. We've all been there where you turn up on a river or you turn up at a play spot and you're quite new to the sport or new to the river or whatever and you feel intimidated by the other paddlers. I've got all this hardcore gear and you've got a boat that's more mid-range and maybe you feel intimidated because you don't you're not as good as what they're perceived to be because they've got all this shiny new gear uh we all know that's not the case you know some people have all the gear and no idea uh and i think manufacturers it would be really good to see them invest a lot more time in sort of what i'd class the middle bracket of their their branding you know like the mid-range boats the people that are paddling class two class three all the time you know you the people that do that rivers you don't need the latest race boat you need a boat designed for what you are doing and i think that's what uh brands should be looking at i think that'd be awesome interesting yeah it's definitely a, a i don't know every I, every time i talk to someone about this i like encounter a new dimension that i hadn't thought of before and that, that really interests me so it's definitely something i'd like to speak about with more people in the future um but i think for for today I think we probably um, unpacked it as far as it, yeah, quite as far as we can. Without, I think it, I could probably, to be honest, I'd like to have a roundtable discussion with a bunch of people on it uh, for for like a future a future podcast idea. Because I, I do think like the continued growth of kayaking is something that we're all in together. Um, Daz, I am.
pretty satisfied that we've talked about everything I wanted to talk about. Is there anything yeah, you want to bring up and how can people follow you on social media and things? Yeah, if you want to follow me on social media, you know, we're all into this social media age. Uh, Instagram is PLE underscore and underscore me, which is obviously Peel and Expeditions and me, uh, Darren Clarkson King on Facebook. Uh, I will accept anybody as a friend on Facebook because I'm a bit of a social media whore sometimes, but you've got to message me first because I don't want you to be a Nigerian prince. And uh, if you want to follow Pure Land Expeditions, you can find us on Facebook. You'll see all our trips coming on there. Uh, we have cool competitions now and then, and we have stories about our trips. Uh, you know, for everything we do is on there. And that's awesome. And it's been really good to chat to you, Seth, mate. Cool. Daz, thanks a lot for your time. Um, no I will see problem. you on the river somewhere soon. Um, yeah, yeah awesome. this has been Question Never Thought to Ask, the Whitewater Kayaking Podcast. We'll see you in two weeks. Peace.